Hello everyone. My name is Jennifer Lavasser. I am a curator here in our space history department and I want to welcome all of you on t uh, tonight on behalf of General Daly, our director here at the museum, to the second lecture in our 2015 Exploring Space series. The series this year is dedicated to the Hubble Space Telescope and 25 years of its operation, servicing, and all of those stunning results that we've all viewed, I'm sure, on our computers, our smartphones, and everywhere else that you could possibly look at these stunning images. The uh, speakers selected for this year's series have covered the range and will cover the range of experience and knowledge of the Hubble Space Telescope. And we want to, of course, thank our sponsors for this event, the United Launch Alliance representatives that are here with us, Kevin Bargo in particular, and uh, the representatives of Aerojet Rocketdyne, uh, including Susan Laver and Joe Cassidy. And I know you're all up there, and thank you very much for sponsoring the uh, events that we're having now. They, they, I'm sure will feel I've repeated a little bit of what I've already said to them tonight with this introduction, but um, I want to give you some context for what we're going to hear about tonight. Um, the program this year began with, um, and I'm sure many of you attended our lecture last month with Frank Seppelina, who really pioneered the idea of servicing the Hubble Space Telescope by astronauts. And tonight's speaker will give us some insight into what that was actually like to do and to carry out in space. Dr. Massimino joined the Astronaut Corps in 1996 along with 30, 30, 43 other astronaut candidates, the largest astronaut class ever, um, which was then uh, deemed the class of the sardines, which I think is a really great um, and kind of characteristic term for that group, which is quite lovely. Um, he's a graduate of Columbia and MIT and uh, just left NASA last year to go back to teaching at Columbia. And he's training the next, hopefully the next generation of engineers uh, to get involved with space exploration. He has experience on two uh, missions, space shuttle missions, to the Hubble Space Telescope, STS-109 in 2002 and STS-125 in 2009. That gives him almost 24 days in space with four trips outside the spacecraft and over 30 total hours of time spacewalking. He, of course, has had a quite an interesting transition to life outside of NASA, including some appearances on television, and uh, it was apparently the inspiration for a particularly interesting George Clooney character in the movie Gravity, from what I hear. <laughs> He's very active in social media and is said to have sent the very first tweet from space during the STS-125 mission. And he's been a frequent guest of Neil deGrasse Tyson on the Star, his Star Talk podcast, and we hope, of course, his new television show, which will be appearing soon on National Geographic Channel. He's also the host, co-host of the Science Garage YouTube series with Don Pettit, one of his fellow astronauts from that 1996 class of astronauts. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Massimino for being here tonight and introduce you. Please uh, welcome me in joining, uh, or welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Massimino. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you very much. I'm the same guy who was just sitting there, so you know, usually I say, how is everyone today? But I know I've, I'm, thank you for staying around. I thought this might not have been a good idea to do questions before, because everyone might run for the hills before the presentation started. So thank you for remaining, remaining here. Um, so what I'll do is uh, I'll talk a little bit about my path to becoming an astronaut. We touched on a little bit of that, but uh, I'll explain some more. And then uh, I'll talk about the missions I was on, the two Hubble Space Telescope servers missions. Um, and I've got some props um, that my friend Justin Cassidy brought when we get to uh, STS-125. I'll show you. This is real space stuff here. This, this flew in space. This right here. So, um, and some other things too we've got here that look very familiar to me. So thank you for bringing those. And so we'll get, we'll get to that in a little bit. So um, I did mention earlier that um, I am young, old enough when I was a young person uh, to remember uh, what happened on uh, in July of 69 with uh, Neil and, and Buzz walking on the moon and uh, where 
Uh, my mo whoever whistled, please leave. Um, this is that just isn't right. There's something wrong about that. I don't know. Okay, so here I am. As I was, I was six years old for Pete's sake. Okay, you're whistling. All right, so uh, here I was dressed up as an astronaut. My uh, my mom converted an elephant costume that I was uh, wore in the school play. It was a circus play, and all the talented kids got to be like the ringleaders or clowns or whatever. And the rest of us they didn't know what to do with, so they made us elephants. And my mom converted that elephant costume to a to a uh, to a, a, an astronaut costume. Um, I'm wearing like my dad's safety glasses, and these are some pins from the Korean War. I don't know what you have, but this was my this was my uh, astronaut outfit. And everyone recognizes who I got here, right? That's Snoopy. Uh, so Snoopy, uh, that was my astronaut Snoopy, and and you might see him later. All right. So as a surprise, you might see him again in another photo. But that was me wanting to be an astronaut as a little kid. Um, we know what we're looking at. Here's a space picture. Anyone, just shout it out. What are we looking at here? New York. Okay, so I grew up kind of over here outside of the frame on Long Island. Here's Manhattan. and So this is where I grew up in the New York area out on Long Island. And as we talked earlier, the question that David asked me about uh, what I was doing in high school, I was just kind of going to high school, doing the best I could. And uh, when I got to college, I was studying engineering. When I got out of college, I took a job working as an engineer. And uh, I started thinking about what I was going to do with my uh, well, with my career, and, and I and I kind of thought about what I thought was what was important to me, what what I what I really wanted to spend my life doing, and I just couldn't give up that little boy dream I had when I was a when I was a little boy, which was to fly in space. Now I didn't really think I could do that, but I thought for sure maybe I could do something with the space program. You know, that they hire people, engineers. Um, maybe I could be someone who works and contributes to the space program in some way. Um, so what I what I did was I had a great opportunity to get more education up in this area. Well, you know what we're looking at here? Yes. Massachusetts, right. So around here Buried under those clouds there is uh, somewhere is MIT, and I was lucky enough to be able to go to grad school at MIT. And when I was at grad school is when I started applying to become an astronaut. So uh, the, the minimum requirement, I was a civilian. My friend Mike Lopez Alegria is here. Is Scooter here by any chance? Scott Altman here? Yell out if you are. Either he's really become really shy or he's not here. So, but uh, Mike L.A., who's here, was a, a, a military Navy person. Uh, I, I went the, the civilian route. So there's many routes to becoming an astronaut. And, uh, for, and, and the minimum requirements at that time for the civilians, anyway, was uh, a, a college degree and some related experience and a master's degree. You could have like three years experience or two years experience plus a master's degree or different combinations. Anyway, when I got my master's degree at MIT, I was eligible to uh, become an astronaut. I, I met the minimum requirements and I applied for the astronaut class of 1990 and was sent a letter saying thanks but no thanks. So I was rejected that first time. I stayed at MIT a few more years. I got my PhD. I applied again and I got back that another response saying no maybe maybe sometime sometime else but we're not interested right now. Um, but I, I got out of grad school and I went to work down here at the Johnson Space Center as a, a research engineer for McDonnell Douglas. And uh, this is where I started to uh, meet some astronauts. I uh, helped develop a display that was used to control the robot arm on the space shuttle. Met a lot of people and I applied again a third time and I got an interview. And uh, for the interview, um, they get to know you very well. You came in for a week. There was a lot of medical exams. There was a selection board interview that you sat down with the whole uh, a group of the selection board which consisted of a bunch of astronauts and other managers from, from NASA. And you talk about yourself and they, you know, they get to know you really well. So once they knew me really well, they made their decisions and told me no. <laughs> so I was 0 for 3. Um, at that same, after right around that time, I was thinking about what else I might do if I was going to stay with my engineering job or maybe try something else. And I had a, an offer to go to this part of the country, which is Atlanta. This is Atlanta at night. And you can see the thin band of our atmosphere. There's this little green line up there. It's very thin. You know, the, the atmosphere is kind of like the, the top peel of it. If you look at the Earth as an onion, you know, the atmosphere is just a little tiny thin um, peel at the top. And this is Atlanta at night. 
magical place that night space becomes. You know, when I, when I first got to space, I wanted to run to the window during the day, day passes to see the earth illuminated. And then uh, I found that the, the, day, the night passes were just spectacular. The, what you could see in the sky, the, the, uh, the stars are these perfect points of light. And uh, the earth is, is just magnificent. You can see the city lights and, and lightning, lighting up the clouds over the ocean and so on. And the, and the atmosphere looks, looks like it does in this picture. Um, so I went to Atlanta and I was teaching at Georgia Tech. I applied again. It was my fourth try. I came uh, in for an interview again and then I was uh, selected as an astronaut. Uh, I got the good phone call that time. So my fourth try was picked. Um, I, this is me over here. Okay, so that, there I am. And there we are, the sardines. Uh, I could tell you a story about each one of these people here. Um, I'll tell you about a couple of them, maybe. This guy here, uh, these, these guys look alike. This is Mark Kelly and his brother Scott who's going to be in space for a year. So you'll be probably hearing a lot about him over the next year, I think, or at least I hope we hear about it, what he's up to up there. Um, but anyway, these are, this is my astronaut class. We were the sardines, 35 Americans and nine internationals. Um, we get to the Johnson Space Center, we, we go through lots of training, and um, the training that I, I uh, really enjoyed, um, I enjoyed all of it, but the, the part that I thought was the coolest was training to do spacewalks. And this is a picture of me getting ready to go inside of the water at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. So I was an astronaut for about, um, for about three and a half years, and I was, uh, I went through the initial training, I was qualified to fly in space, I was qualified to be a spacewalker and do other things, and uh, John Grunsfeld, who was on the previous um, Hubble mission, which was STS-103, and they flew that in December of, of 1999, he was helping with the planning of the next Hubble mission, which was going to be STS-109. And uh, he comes into my office and he says, uh, he says, hey, Mass, that's my, my nickname is Mass. He goes, you know, I'm putting together a bunch of, a bunch of people to, uh, to help with some of these development runs we're going to be doing in, uh, in the water in, uh, you know, for the next Hubble flight. And they go, he goes, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to be one of, the, one of the subjects to come in the water with us. I'm like, yeah, you know, absolutely. And uh, so I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm able to do this. You know, I get, my name gets thrown in the, into the into the hopper and, and I'll, I, I never forget this day I went down there and, and probably Ed was there and Russ and Justin and this whole Hubble team was there um, at the pool. Now, did, we didn't go in the water that day we were just getting briefed on what the mock-up looked like and what the mission was about and all this stuff and um, I, I was I was I don't know what the right word is to describe it. I was uh, starstruck, amazed, uh, just captivated by this team that was there. There's a guy named Ron Sheffield, who's not here tonight. I, I think I've got him in one of my pictures here later. But this team was amazing. They, uh, they loved this telescope. They knew every inch of it. They knew every bolt. They knew how, how it worked. They knew, they were so dedicated to what they were doing. Um, they realized that what they, we were going to work on, or what the crew was going to work on, whoever was going to go, was the, arguably the greatest scientific instrument ever. And, and they were a part of this team that took care of the telescope and trained the astronauts and built the tools that were going to be used on these servicing missions. And I think that that's really what got my attention. I knew Hubble was really cool and being a chance, beginning a chance to fly on one of those missions would be really great. But it became immediately apparent to me that really the best thing about getting to fly on Hubble was getting to be a part of this team. And it's even more than a team, it really was like a family. And it was a lot of people. A lot of them were there. There was, and there was all ages. And most of the times we'd get briefed by people who were fairly young. There were people who were young, but there was a lot of older guys there too who had been there from when the telescope was first built and remained with the project and were there to help us. And they just poured out all this knowledge to us, to me and the other astronauts that were going to do these development runs. And it really changed my, it really changed my life, really, that those, those, that first day of seeing this and wanting to be a part of it so badly. Uh, boy, what I would do to get a chance to be a part of this team. And uh, luckily, I was, I was chosen to fly on that mission on STS-109 as it turned out. Um, 
This is a picture of that team. This is, uh, let's see, I don't know if Ed's in this one, but here's Justin over there and Jill. There I am. This is a long time ago. This is probably right, I think we took this picture right before we flew. Russ, you're in here somewhere. There's Russ. There's John Grunfels. There's this guy. Ed, where were you during we took this picture? Uh, you know what? <laughs> what? Did you take the picture? Yeah. I don't think you're there. There's Rick Linehan. Um, uh, and there's, there's Ron Sheffield, there's Jim Newman, and there's a bunch of other guys. But we took, this is, I think this might have been like our last run before we went to space together. But it's a, it's a, 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 great, uh, a great team and getting a chance to be a part of this team for SES 109 was, was just a, a, a really a blessing. So uh, there's the crew going out to the, to the launch pad. Uh, this is now, this happened back in 2002, so just we just had our 13th anniversary a little bit ago. Scott Altman, our commander, Dwayne Carey was the other rookie on the flight, our pilot, Nancy Curry was our flight engineer, and then the four dudes in the back were the spacewalkers. John was matched up with Rick Linehan, and there I am, my, uh, my, my spacewalking partner was Jim Newman. So I've got this uh, launch footage here. Start eight, seven, six, main engine start. Space Shuttle to widen our view of the universe through the Hubble Space Telescope. See that clip floating? That's evidence that we were in space. <laughs> Any, anything that isn't tied down will begin to float. Uh, so that was my first launch into space. Um, it was an early morning launch. We got out there kind of in the middle of the night to get loaded into the space shuttle. There was a cloud deck right above the launch pad. So as we went through it, our flame kind of lit it up. Um, but uh, going into space, my first launch was uh, was 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 quite an experience. Um, you know, you had, you you're waiting, you're on your back for a few hours waiting, and then you get closer. Jim Newman, uh, my uh, spacewalking buddy, was uh, this was his fourth flight. So, and I, I, what he had told me was every time he went to launch all of his flights, when he went out to the launch pad, they didn't launch that day. He said, I'm a jinx. Don't expect, don't expect to launch that day. You know, we're gonna get out there and you know, we're gonna have to come back and do it another day. So I was like, okay. So uh, we get out there and, and uh, you know, we're in the, we're, and he's sitting next to me and, and I'm like, so when are we gonna get, go back and have more breakfast? You know, because you know, I'm getting a little hungry. He's like, oh, don't worry, it's gonna happen eventually. And it's, you know, we're down to a couple minutes or so. And uh, do you wanna nudge this guy? The doctor had a lot of surgery today. He's sleeping right here. I'm sorry. I, just, I don't want to. You're right. Do you need a pillow? He's right there. Okay. Sorry. I, I couldn't help myself. He, it's a guy right in front of me. I'm like, is everyone else awake? Lower the lights over here. I'm really sorry. It's a terrible thing I just did. I'm going to be. I am so embarrassed. I'm so, I can't believe I did that. I couldn't. I thought I was seeing things. I thought maybe he needed help. But I'm, I'm really sorry, doc. This is a, a, a surgeon who's had a rough day. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to embarrass you. But I couldn't help it. It was right in front of me. Oh my. All right, everyone else, go back to sleep. What the heck was I talking about? Launching. Launching. So I'm there next to Newman, and uh, so I'm ready, like, you know, when are we gonna get, when are we gonna get at it? Well, you, did you see the launch, Doc? We just had a launch here. So, uh, so, uh, so Newman, so I'm, I'm asking, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Newman, I feel terrible, I'm so embarrassed. So anyway, uh, so, anyway, so Newman, is, so I'm like, you know, when are we gonna leave? And he's like, you know, don't expect to go anywhere, you know, and I'm like, oh. but we get down to a couple minutes, and I'm like, hey, Jim, we're running out of time, you know, like, we gotta, and he's like, well, maybe we're gonna go, and I'm like, you said we weren't. <laughs> At six seconds, the main engine's light, and the whole stack lurches forward. And then it comes back, and it comes back right at zero. 
and, and in the solid rocket's light and you go. And it wasn't like, oh, I wonder if we've left. You know, that we really go. You're moving. By the time you get to the, by, you're already going a couple hundred miles an hour when his photo is taken. And you go from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in, in only eight and a half minutes. So it's just this rush of acceleration, power, speed, and you're, a, you're really moving. And at first I remember like looking at my, my, you know, my experienced buddies was like, is this the what it's supposed to be like? Because this doesn't seem right. But they were like, no, no, this is good. This. So anyway, that's what, that's what launch was like. And then the engine's cut and it's calm and you, you go to work. Um, on our third day in orbit, we arrived at the Hubble Space Telescope, and that's what it looked like. You can see the solar rays that it had at the time were a little bit bent, sort of, and they were bent. Um, and we had to replace those. I'll show you some, some uh, f footage of that. This is my first spacewalk. So the tradition is that you get a chance to move around a little bit and get used to being in space, and you come up and take a photo in front of the window. And uh, that's what I did, trying to look really cool and happy uh, and not scared at all. You know, trying to be trying to be a cool astronaut. You can see the Earth in the top of my visor being reflected. That's from my first my first few minutes of spacewalking. Um, this is some uh, uh, footage. This is um, from my helmet camera. We had uh, cameras on our helmets, and we're uh, retracting this old solar array, folding it up and taking it. And then we would remove it off the telescope and put these new uh, arrays on the telescope. So instead of those kind of flimsy ones, they, these were rigid arrays that opened like a book, uh, as opposed to unraveling like the old arrays did. Um, and we had to rotate them by hand. So this was on my first spacewalk. I was a little concerned about this, because we weren't allowed to tether to the, um, to the, um, my mic seems to be going in now. You guys hear me okay up there? Um, we weren't allowed to tether to those arrays because they were too big and, and they, if, if they got away, they may take us with them. So we had, to, we had to do without being tethered. So we had to go very, very slowly. They had an off-center center of, center of, uh, of, of mass. And if, if you move them too much, they could get out of control. And uh, they were really big and we didn't have any extras. So I couldn't, I, had to, I, I couldn't lie about losing it. You know, if it went away, I'd be like, I don't know what happened. You know, don't oh, you lie. Lost it, so I, I very, very carefully moved it, and we got them both in and air. And you can see the, the view uh, uh, above us as we're working is just phenomenal. And I'll talk more about that. It's, it's really, it's really quite an experience to be out there in a, in your spacesuit. And they have this wonderful exhibit here now that I kind of went through quickly, but I want to spend more time in it about the, the dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the first spacewalk. And you're, you're in your own spaceship when you go out there, and the difference. That I would describe is from looking out the window to actually going and, and doing the spacewalk. It's kind of like looking at an aquarium versus being a scuba diver. You know, you're looking at the aquarium, oh, look at the pretty fish. And then you're a scuba diver, you're out there in your own spacesuit, life support, kind of interacting with that environment. I really felt like a spaceman when I was out there, um, when I was out there in space. And the view is, is just amazing. Uh, Hubble, we're 350 miles up, and you can see the curve of the Earth. And it takes up you know, your, the Earth takes up your whole field of view, but it's it's just it's just magnificent. Um, some of the cool things I noticed, I'll tell you a couple stories. One is is uh, you, you're going around the the planet 17,500 miles an hour, so it's 90 minutes for one lap, and so it's basically 45 minutes of darkness and 45 minutes of, of sunlight. And the temperature swing is, is, is drastic in that too. I mean, you're in the space, it would be a, it would be a few hundred degrees swing if you, if you did not have your spacesuit on. Um, and, but because you're in the shuttle and you have your spacesuit, it kind of modulates that. But you still feel warmth and cold as you go from, as you cycle through this. And one thing I, you could, one thing I know is like I could kind of feel the sunrise. I could kind of feel it coming. And uh, during my first spacewalk, I, I felt it and I looked, and what I saw was the Earth and this line, where here we're in darkness going into sunlight, and this line is the day-night line. And I'm watching it move. I'm watching this line move across the planet. And I looked and I saw the sun off in the distance as a, looking like a very big star, just hanging out there. And I looked back at the Earth and I, I saw this line moving and I realized what I was looking at was I could see the rotation of the Earth. And, and, and we see a sunrise 
you know the sun the sun rises in the in the east and sets in the west and 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 we have this we know this happens but the sun really isn't doing anything it's us that is moving around it and uh, and we are rotating and you can look at this and say okay right in this part of the earth it's dark and it's still dark here and then this line starts moving and it starts getting lighter and then a few few moments later they're in the sunlight it's a different way to experience a sunrise um, from a spacewalk um, this picture is from my second my second spacewalk and uh, I had an opportunity to actually enjoy the view my, my first spacewalk I didn't look around that much. I, I was, it seemed like I was busy a lot of the time and concentrating on what I was doing. My second spacewalk, I had moments where I could enjoy it a little bit more. Um, at, this, at this time, this was right after we installed the advanced camera for surveys and, and Jim Newman was bringing the old instrument that we had taken out. We were going to stow it to bring it home. And I was waiting for him and my, my friends took this picture from the cabin. And uh, right after this photo was taken, you can see the earth in my, in my visor. I remember looking over and trying to enjoy the view. And uh, the, first, the first thought went through my mind was, um, this is too beautiful for people to look at. This is not something that we're supposed to see. And I actually turned my head away from it. It was, too, it was so beautiful I could only stand to look at it. And then, um, and then I got over that. And, uh, <laughs> And then took another look, and um, I started to get a bit emotional because it was so. What I was seeing, I couldn't believe how beautiful the Earth was, and I, I, I wasn't thinking about anything else except what I was looking at, and uh, forgot about you know the job necess you know that I knew we were still working, but you know I just really tried to enjoy what I was looking at, and I and I thought if you know, if you if if you know if this is so beautiful, um, if if you were in in heaven, this is what you would you would see this would be the view from heaven and then i thought no no this is this is more beautiful than that this is what heaven must look like that's how beautiful the planet looked to me that day from that spacewalk it looked like i was looking into paradise um here's some video from uh from that flight uh just living in space stuff uh john grunsfeld shaven that's a that's a hygiene kit that shows you things can float if you if if uh, you don't keep good track of them uh, this is a exercise device that uh, digger is bringing down that's me exercising my legs and my mouth at the same time um, and a group meal everyone just hanging around and if you do a good job at the end of the day you get a treat so. Um, this is our, uh, some film of our entry, uh, Scott Altman, uh, our commander bringing the space shuttle back home, this is Space Shuttle Columbia, and uh, you can see these flashes that you see up there, that's the, the heat of uh, the, the friction, all that energy that gets you to go that fast has to be taken out, and it gets taken out through friction as you come through the atmosphere, and that's a, that's a view looking out the overhead window of the tail. Through with a mirror or, or, or getting heated up. Um, where it was a night landing, so this is an infrared image, so anything hot is going to show up as white. Um, and the scenes that you see, this, this scene here is a heads-up display out the window of the cockpit. Uh, this is what our commander is looking at to help him line himself up for the, for the landing. And then the gear comes down. And there's the runway lit up at the Kennedy Space Center. And you can see altitude on the right and airspeed on the left. Those, those numbers are changing as he's getting closer and closer to, to the runway. And look at the wheels are black right now because they're cool. And they'll hit the runway and spin up white hot. And then the chute comes out. Um, this is uh, a non-infrared image. Uh, this is the same landing. We only landed once. Here's a third view of it. <laughs> But uh, I thought Scooter was going to be here, so I wanted to make sure you got a good view of the landing. But uh, yeah, that's from another angle, and here's the rollout um, to a stop on the, on the runway at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, then they come and fetch you, and you get out, and you, look, you, you walk around the spaceship, and that is Space, space Shuttle Columbia. That is the last successful landing of Space Shuttle Columbia was our flight, SDS-109. The next crew that took Columbia up to space was the 107 crew. 
Um, that was the next time Space Shuttle Columbia flew. And it was their launch in January of 2003. And this is what happened on February 1. We lost Columbia. And uh, as a result, uh, our uh, management, our leaders, and everyone else re-examined what we were doing with the shuttle program and, and what NASA was doing and so on. And uh, they decided that they were going to end the space shuttle program after they finished completing the build of the International Space Station. And uh, the Hubble mission, the next Hubble mission that was planned was canceled. Um, they felt it was too dangerous that if you went to the space station with the space shuttle and you inspected your vehicle, which we, you know, after this accident happened, we made a lot of changes. And one of the changes was is that you would inspect your spaceship and uh, if you had damage, you would try to fix it. And if you couldn't fix it, if you're at the space station, you would just wait at the space station. There's life support, there's a place to stay and uh, until they could figure out a way to get you home with a Soyuz and maybe another shuttle. With the uh, space with the Hubble, that wasn't an option because there was no life support at the telescope. So once you got there, if there was damage you could not fix, you were kind of stuck because you couldn't hang out there very long. Um, and they just felt it was too dangerous. And uh, so they canceled the mission. Um, during that, that time period, there was a couple years where a bunch of us, uh, meaning the Hubble team and a couple of astronauts worked on this robotic servicing mission uh, to go up with uh, a robotic mission to service the Hubble. And then a new administrator came, came in, Mike Griffin, and he uh, had uh, his team look at a way to, to put the, the, the Hubble mission back on the books. So what the plan was, uh, the way they got Hubble approved to fly again, to fly another Hubble mission, was not only would they have a space shuttle going to Hubble on the launch pad, but they would have a rescue space shuttle on the launch pad in case uh, the Hubble crew was stuck uh, on uh, at Hubble and couldn't come home safely. There was a crew in quarantine ready to go to come and start a, a rescue mission. They would rendezvous with the with the telescope with the uh, with the shuttle, and they do a transfer of crew, and then everyone would come home on the rescue shuttle. So that was the plan, and that's how they got Hubble back uh, approved. Uh, the next mission approved. And that was STS 125. And I was lucky enough to be on that mission as well. Um, after I flew that first one, being around with some of the people in this room that worked Hubble and uh, going with that experience, I really wanted to go back again. I wanted to be part of that team again. And I was very fortunate that I was uh, uh, selected to go on, on that final servicing mission. Uh, so this is my crew that I went with on SCS 125. Um, Megan MacArthur is driving the armored personnel carrier. This is a, a training exercise we did at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, if we needed to get away from the space shuttle and, and we needed to drive this vehicle, we each took turns driving. Here Megan is driving us around. She was our flight engineer. It was her first space flight. John Grunsfeld, who I flew with on STS-109, this was going to be his third trip to Hubble. Uh, he was our spacewalking uh, leader. He was our EV-1. You know, he was the guy in charge overall of all the spacewalks. He was teamed up with Drew Foisel, who was making his first trip into space. I was the EVA leader of the second team, along with uh, my spacewalking buddy Mike Good, who was making his first trip into space. Scott Altman was again our commander, and uh, Greg Johnson was a first time space flyer as the pilot on the mission. Uh, we did a, a, a lot of a lot of training, of course. Again, a lot of it in the in the pool, the neutral buoyancy lab. This is a. We also made an IMAX movie, which they showed here earlier. Did you people get to see it? Did someone get to see it? Okay, so this is this is cool. You saw the images from the tank. I don't think you saw the camera though in the water, right? These guys showed up one day. This is me over here, and if you saw the movie, I was going in. They showed me going into the telescope and stuff like this, and and I said I was a big goon. I had to be careful. I think is that what I was saying? You know, and Mike. Anyway, so this is at the beginning of that. Of that that was that was the same day. This is when we filmed it, and this is Mike on the end of the arm, and here I am getting ready to open up the door so we could go in and do the gyros, which we showed in the movie. And these guys are these divers that have this underwater IMAX camera. These were cool guys. <laughs> these guys, they had this guy Howard Hall, who was the uh, the the leader of their filming team, had done a lot of underwater IMAX movies, and he was the first guy ever to swim outside of a steel cage with a with a great white shark 
And you know, these are you know at the pool. There's these divers. You know, these these professional divers that dive in the pool with us. And this one guy, who had a very experienced guy named Greg Sims, was like, "Oh, the Howard Hall's here today." I go, yeah. What's the story with him? Was he flew outside? You know, he flew. He uh, he was outside this. He was the only guy to ever be outside of a of a of a steel cage with a with a great white shark filming him. And I go, "Wow." So I, I became kind of friends with Howard. I asked him, "What's the story with you swimming out with that great white shark?" He goes, "He goes, oh yeah, I didn't plan to do that. It just happened." He was like. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't think there was any sharks around and somehow he went outside of the thing to do something or look at something and next thing you know a great white shark shows up so that was that was his claim to fame there but but Howard and his team were a really cool bunch of people and they came in with this tank and lit up the uh, I mean with the came into the tank with this big camera that they flew around it looked like like some kind of giant sea creature here that they're moving around and uh, and they, that's where the scenes you saw were filmed you can see it's very bright uh, they, they lit up the it usually was kind of a little bit murky under the water Water. You know, you could see fine, but they really made it. It was almost like daylight uh, with all these lights they brought in to do that filming. Um, the task I'm going to talk specifically about is on the second mission was uh, was a new type of task. We we generally in the past had removed things and put a whole new replacement on. We removed the solar arrays, we removed instruments, we removed the power control unit that they have on display here as well. That a whole thing came out and a whole new one went in. Um, there were two instruments, the Advanced Camera for Surveys and the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, STIS, which is shown here, that uh, we did not have replacements for. And they had failed power supplies and so the the challenge to the team was, well, what could we do to try to fix this, uh, th these instruments because we don't have a full replacement for them? Can we get inside these instruments? These instruments were never intended to be taken, a taken apart in space. Um, for example, the power supply that looked like a computer board, I'll show you in a second, was hidden behind this main electronics board, which had over 100 small screws attached to the instrument. You had to remove all these screws, and they had washers, and they also had staking material, which was kind of like a glue on the threads, and no debris could get inside of the telescope. So we had to figure out a way to remove that electronics board, pull out the, uh, the failed card, put a new card in, and then put a replacement cover, um, and do that within, a, do that during a spacewalk where you're, you know, we're in more or less boxing gloves and, you know, can't really see very well inside of there. And so this was a, this was a no debris allowed to get inside of the telescope. So this was the challenge. And what I want to point out here is that this handrail, had to come off first before we could start messing with these little screws. So I've got some props here that I can show you. Uh, in order to capture all of those screws, um, and this is uh, Justin Cassidy who's sitting in the front row here. My friend was nice enough to bring, th this did not fly, this is what we used in the pool, right? So this is, a, this is something that I practiced with many times in the neutral buoyancy lab. So this plate, and I'll show you a picture. Hang on one second, let me go back over. I'll let that fall out. <laughs> So this plate that you see me practicing with in that picture actually is this one right here. So what I'm in that picture, I'm holding holding up what I was using, and we removed a couple screws, put some anchors in, and then attached. Once that hand, remember the handrail has to come off. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Handrail comes off. We put some anchors in and we attach this plate to it, and then we used um, a power tool. The the Hubble team. Power tool you see me holding there. Is this a flight version? No. This is not okay, so I can play around with this one. Um, it's probably the one I'm holding there, I bet you, right? Don't you think? So that one that I'm holding there, I'm holding right here. So this tool we used uh, to practice, this was a mini power, we call this the mini power tool. I mean, because our other power tool is a big tool, uh, the pistol grip tool, which had it was high torque, went up to 60 RPM. This one went up to, what did we get? It's about 180. You ever get? We got how fast did this go? Almost 300. It went up to 300 RPM? Now he tells me. <laughs> no, so it went up to 300. Really? No kidding. I thought, okay, boy, how easily we forget. So this would go up to, th really? 300 RPM? <laughs> I thought 180 was a... Was 200 a, sound better? 200 sounds better, but what's the truth? This is the National Air and Space Museum. Was it, we really just could go, went up to th the, the flight? 300 RPM. Wow. Okay, 300 RPM on this guy. And uh, so it allowed us to do these, these small screws. It, it gave us a better feel. The other tool is kind of bulky and big, but this gave us a better feel if we, if we really had the, the, the little, that little baby screw in, engaged so we could, 
we could uh, pull the trigger at, at with uh, high speed and, and, and do this job because we had lots of fasteners to undo. Um, it also had a ring of lights in the front too, so we could you know, we could illuminate what we're looking at in the in the in the darkness. If we got you know because it get a little dark inside the telescope during the during a sunset and so on. So. Um, this was the tool we trained with. The, the one we used in space was exactly like this. Exactly, right? Same everything. Okay. Um, and then we had these, we wanted to be able to change our bits out easily because we had lots of different sizes of screws. So Justin and his team, uh, Ed Rezac and these other guys are, are scattered throughout this crowd here and somewhere in the area uh, tonight, they all designed these, these things for us to use. These were different uh, bits that we used to take out the different size screws. And they, they in, invented this special bit carrier so that we could get these bits out instead of, usually changing out a bit was a bit of an involved process. But since we had to do it so often, they made it so it was much easier using this tool and this caddy. Um, once we got the, uh, the front of the board off, we then had to remove this, uh, this, uh, the power supply, which is one of these boards, and would have 120 pins. Did I get, am I remember correctly? There's 120 pins in the back of each one, in the back of that power supply, so they had to be undocked from those 120 pins, and then we had to install a new one in. And so they invented this tool, which would give us some leverage grabbing onto that board. And then you can see the, the dials are large here, right? So you can do this with a gloved hand. Um, they have little arrows in here, and because I was doing this task, they had to remind me open and close <laughs> what direction I was going in. Um, but we use this to go and grab, lock onto that uh, that power supply, one of those boards, the top one, wasn't it? Just the top one, grab onto it and then drive it off with this thing, and then insert a new one. So all these tools, over 100 new tools were designed for this one particular task. But before we could do any of this, that hand drill had to come off. <laughs> Remember that. Okay, this is my picture, my other picture of the team. This is right before we flew. I think this was our last run. There's Ed Rezac, who's in like the fifth row. He's right there. Uh, Scooter and, and Drew, me and John, Megan. Uh, these two people in the middle, Tomas and Christy. Tomas was our uh, lead uh, trainer for the EVA test, for the spacewalking test, and he was in the control room as our lead flight controller for spacewalks. And then Christy handled, she was called our task lead, so she handled the, uh, the, the checklists and all the details. They worked together, and, and what I noticed about these folks, I remember they came in to visit us in quarantine, because we had a little class with them right before we left to go to the Cape, and I could tell they were really happy with how we were done, how we had done in training and we were about to go. And they were so excited for us. It, it's, I, I don't know if I can explain this well enough, but when you get to know people like this as well as we got to know them, and they are so dedicated to getting you ready to fly in space, um, when they came to see us and we said goodbye to them before we were going to go fly, um, it, was, it was really a very meaningful moment for me you know, to hear from them and to see them. And I, I got the true sense from them that they were excited, as excited as we were for us to go and that they were as hopeful for our success as we were and that their, you know, their job was for us to be successful and that us being successful was going to make them successful and they wanted nothing more. Uh, just terrific people. We spent a lot of time with them, very dedicated people, uh, Christy and Tomas. So that was one of our last NBL runs. This is our launch of SCS 125. So now after the accident, one thing they did is they mounted cameras on different different pieces of the of the spacecraft and uh, of the of the uh, rockets to give us more data in case some debris came uh, and hit the space shuttle like it did on STS-107. 
but it also gave us some better images to use for our movies afterwards. So you're going to get some interesting views that we didn't have before, because uh, this was all this is part of the you know the the process was to inspect all this film after we launched. They would have people look at it to make sure that everything was okay. So this is off the solid rocket as we're heading to space. Now two and a half minutes, the solid rockets go away, and the shuttle keeps going to space. And the the solid rockets. This one's doing like a flip as it heads toward Earth to be recovered. And you see off in the distance, you'll see a, that that is the shuttle. That star is a shuttle continuing on its way to orbit. Um, so we this unlike the other launch, which we were out there at nighttime. We were this was a day launch on Atlantis for SES 125. Um, and Hubble looked different when we got there because it had the different solar arrays that we had installed on uh, on 109. Um, this is from that spacewalk that I was telling you about, the STIS repair, where we were going to use all these tools and we had practiced uh, for many years actually getting ready to do this repair and then we, even before we were assigned as a crew, uh, the Hubble team was working on it and some astronauts, I, I was lucky enough to be involved with that too before we were assigned and that's when we got once we got assigned we, we trained for a few years to do this and um, what happened to me was on that um, handrail, the two bolts on the top came off, no problem. We, we never suspected this was going to be a problem. It never was a problem in training. The two bolts on the bottom, one on the left came off, the one on the right did not come off. And, uh, and, I, and the reason it wasn't coming off is because the head of the bolt was stripped out. And uh, I, I looked at it as I was wondering what was going on and I took a better look at it and I realized that the head of that, that bolt was, I had spun the tool inside of it and kind of destroyed any chance of it being able to grip to undo that screw and that handrail wasn't going to come off and then we couldn't get to the main electronics board cover. This, inch, this nice thing that Justin and his team came up with, we were never going to get to use that and uh, we were never going to be able to replace the power supply, never get this back, never find out if there was life on other planets and I was going to be blank. So that's pretty much, that was pretty much my thought process just like that. Um, so the team started troubleshooting on the ground and I started uh, trying not to make things worse in, uh, in space and they had me come to the front of the space, after the troubleshooting for about an hour is the way I remember it. You guys kind of remember, uh, uh, how long did it come up? Did it take to come up with that solution that we finally did? About an hour or so? Oh. It was a while. That's, a, that's an eternity out there. It means the sun's coming up and down, and I'm wondering this is going on for a while. And sooner or later, we're going to have to knock it off and come inside. We were running out of time. And uh, Dave Lacrone is here, too. Dave Lacrone was, was going crazy in the back room. Uh, one of our Hubble scientists is laughing there. Yeah, is that Ed laugh? Who's laughing? Is that who is? Jimmy's laughing, okay. Stop the laughing. No, no. Jimmy's laughing because he knows Ed was going nuts, wasn't he? Dave was going nuts. I'm sorry. Ed probably was asleep. Uh, everyone was going nuts. What did he do to our, to our mission? Okay, here it comes. Um, and they told me to get uh, tape and vice grips from. Now, vice grips seem to make sense because that was like a tool. Tape, I thought we were running out of ideas. I, I didn't even know we had, I didn't even know we had tape out there. I had no idea. I go, you gotta be kidding me. We're gonna get that. Well, how about the staples? What are we gonna try now? We were trying everything for an hour, nothing was working. So now we're going from the hardware store to the stationery. Office supplies now. We couldn't find anything in the hardware store to work. Go to the office supply store. So it was in the front of the shuttle, and uh, when this picture do I look happy in this picture? I am not happy in this picture. I'm very, very, very sad, actually. And um, my friend uh, Drew Foistel was trying to get my attention in the window, I thought to, you know, make a, a very bad gesture at me for screwing up our mission. And I remember looking up at him, and we couldn't talk because then the ground would hear us, but we were kind of like playing charades. I could see him pretty closely, right? And I was like, you know, what? And he's smiling and laughing and giving me a thumbs up. And I was like, is there another spacewalk going on out here that I don't know about? Why in the world would you be happy right now? And he was telling me, we're going to be okay. You know, we're, gonna, we're in this together. Hang in there. We're going to figure this out. Just hang in there. And if there was ever a time I needed a friend, it was then. And uh, Drew uh, and my crewmates kept me going, and, and we, we hung in there. And then the solution came up that some really, who was it that figured this out down there? And got, was, you guys were in Houston, right? I always gave like James Cooper credit for this. Was that who it was? James Cooper. Okay, so James Cooper, he can call me anytime. I told him he can call me any time of the day, any, and I'll give him his credit card number, and I will buy him whatever he wants. If he's at, you know, whatever drink he wants, it's on me. 
James Cooper and his team were back, and he's, a bunch of engineers were back at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And they pulled like one of these Apollo 13 things. Well, what does Mike have on board? They had a mock-up of the instrument, and they thought they tried a few different things, and then someone had, I'm giving James the credit, but someone had the idea to let's see if Mike could just yank this thing off. And they, and they hooked up, a, I'll show you what they did. They hooked up this scale to, to, a, to a handrail, and this is what they did. They pulled on it. Okay, and that scale said, I think it said 60 pounds. That's what I remember, 60 pounds of force was required. Did they send you guys this tape? They sent you the tape? Okay, if I was them, I wouldn't have sent this tape. Because you see that thing went flying, right? But uh, did you tell Sakachi that the thing went, did he see the tape? Did our flight director see the tape? Okay, all right, well anyway, uh, these smart young people on a Sunday afternoon at the Goddard Space Flight Center came up with this solution. Now this might seem simple. Does this seem simple to you? Yeah. I am convinced to this day I would have never thought of it. <laughs> all right, we were, I was thinking, we were thinking all kinds of things. That, I was just trying to stay in the game, but I'm sure everyone else was thinking of all different solutions, but these smart young people came up with this solution. And I'll show, this is, they, they rated on, so Tony Sakachi and Dan Burbank, our Capcom, gave me the word to see if we could yank this thing off. I and I know we're running late here, so we're almost uh, done. In the this is some uh, half shroud of the footage of the spacewalks, and then we'll sh I'll show you what happened with the handle to, uh, coming up. The doors, uh, protective doors over the fixed head star trackers and the rate sensor units. And now looking from the opposite uh, helmet cam. So this is, you uh, saw some of this, I think, on the IMAX movie, where I was inside the telescope doing the, uh, the RSUs, the rate sensor units. That's with my helmet camera handing it out to uh, Mike Good. And uh, there you Mike go. That's go Mike down. putting the new one in. That's a new uh, rate CD sensor unit, new, new, new gyro package going in. Planet Houston for EVA, we have a good alignment. We got, system, RSU. We got good news, so Mike reacts well RSU here in a second. Three. There he is. <laughs> Hooray! And we copy go for RSU 3. Uh, another task we had was batteries to replace the batteries on the telescope, and that's what you're looking at here. That whole big black thing there is a battery. Actually, it's a battery module with with multiple batteries inside. And um, you notice how I said multiple? I can't remember how many. And usually I would make up a number, but all these humble people here I don't want to be wrong. How many was in there? Three, three, three modules, three modules in the in the one in the one unit. Okay, so now I'm outside messing around with the STIS. And here's, uh, with the big power tool, I'm seeing these red lights, and I can't get that. And Harris said, I don't want to strip it, but it was already too late. I already had stripped it. And, uh, that darn handrail. Did you hear what Drew said? That darn handrail. <laughs> All right, so here I, then we get the instructions to tape it and then to rip it off, and this is what I'm doing there. And burr, there you go. <laughs> So here's my here's my re the reaction of my commander. I, I interviewed him after. The objective: the old one might not come out. We almost <laughs> break the drive run. Then we can't get our shoes in. It goes long. Then uh, you're out there. You got a bar that you had to break off manually. Right. What's up with? Is that high tech? No. It's me in my garage. <laughs> All right. That kind of sums it up. Um, then I was happy. <laughs> I was happy after that. Um, That's Megan. Uh, we're, we're running late here. This is a video of eating in space that I want to show you. Did you see this in the IMAX movie? You saw you saw part of this, I think, in the IMAX movie. Starboard Of Drew, uh, you'll see of Drew coming up here. So, so notice so Megan's so hair. This is MST and she's going to open up her food locker and show you something she's going to eat. It's mine that's in here, so I look up. We talked about food earlier. This is what I was looking for, ravioli. Oh, ravioli, pretty good stuff. I just had some. And in the IMAX movie, you saw this, didn't you? Do you want to see it again? Yeah. All right, here we go. One thing you probably know is Mike Good oblivious to what's going on behind him. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right. Uh, a couple of fun items we had on board. Uh, someone asked me if earlier about looking through a telescope when I was a kid. This is a, a replica of the telescope that Galileo used to make his observations 400 years early. It was the 400th, 400th anniversary of Galileo making his observations, so we had his telescope on board with uh, on board Space Shuttle Atlantis with Hubble in the background. And, and there I am with the plate that Russ Werneth asked me about, this home plate from Shea Stadium in my Mets jersey. Uh, this, of course, was after all the spacewalks were done and we were happy uh, that everything worked out okay, but that, that uh, home plate is now on display at the Intrepid Museum in New York. Um, here we are having a group meal, and remember who I told you to look for earlier? There he is. That is that same Snoopy. Now, if you noticed in the picture when I was a little guy, he had a helmet on. That helmet was made of cheap plastic that went away in the fourth grade. I think I dropped Snoopy on a concrete and that was the end of him. That was the end of the, the uh, so he can't go EVA. He had to stay inside. But that is the same Snoopy. I still have him. That's the same Snoopy I had as a little boy. There he is with us in space. Uh, we landed at Edwards, Edwards Air Force Base uh, and then we enjoyed seeing that we actually were suc really successful in the mission once we get the first images coming back. Um, what we're looking at here is about, uh, about 100,000 stars within a field of about 10 million stars. Each one of these stars is similar to our sun in an Omega Centauri. This is, uh, this is the butterfly nebula from end to end. This is about two light years from one end of that dying star to the next. And then the final image is Stefan's Quintet. So we have five galaxies. One is brighter and that's closer than these other four. Uh, these two in the middle are, are colliding. So, you know, the, you know, why do we go into space? Why do we take the risk or all the hard work that our you know, my, my, uh, my friends who are here tonight uh, have done, and all the people at the Goddard Space Flight Center and at Johnson Space Center and around the world that have contributed to Hubble, um, it's really fun. It's really cool work, but it also produces some great science and discoveries, and, and that's, I think, another reason why we all feel that we're very lucky to have been part of the Hubble Space Telescope program. And uh, uh, it was 25 years since it launched, and I don't know if we're going to get another 25 years out of it. What do you guys think? Still going. Still going. So we'll see how long we can get it to keep going and maybe have another anniversary party here years from now. But I feel very, very lucky to have gotten a chance to be a part of that Hubble family in my career as an astronaut. Wouldn't have traded it for anything. Um, and I feel very privileged to be here at the National Air and Space Museum with you, uh, with all of you here tonight. Thank you for coming. Do we have some time for questions? Do we have time for questions? So did you want to help me with these, Dave? I thought it was, I had so much fun with Dave earlier that I think we should bring him back to help with the questions. What do you think? All right, so. Uh, well, I'll just make sure that uh, everybody gets a chance right here. How close did that broken piece of the handle get to your spacesuit? It looked like it was pretty close. How close did the, uh, I'm supposed to repeat the question, so if I forget to do that, Dave, let me know, okay. That's so it's one of us has to repeat the question. Right. So how close did the broken piece of the handrail get to my spacesuit? Um, that was a concern. That's why I had to do that, do the tape taping at the bottom, because they were afraid of, we were afraid of some piece of metal coming loose and either getting me or going up into the telescope. I was pretty sure I'd be okay. I was worried about any debris at all getting into the telescope, because that could be catastrophic. So we, Mike Good and I both, he was looking over my shoulder and helping me. We want to make sure we really had that thing taped well. So nothing came at me. And when we, we made, we actually looked in, in the transmission, which was cut off, we'd say, I didn't see anything come off. It came off clean. And Mike verified that. And, and uh, we were pretty happy the way it broke off. But it really, I mean, it, it just kind of, I yielded it. I gave it a couple of tugs to kind of weaken it and then gave it one good snap at the end. And, uh, and it, it came out pretty, pretty clean. But Justin has seen the real screws. It, it did, you know, there was some debris that was uh, that was captured by that tape. So it was a good thing that we did tape it up. But um, but I think it went about as well as it could. Okay, we got about four questions backed up here. Who was the first? Right there. Yes. Very incredible example for persistence. 
talked about your fourth time uh, being successful. You talk about uh, obviously that would be very frustrating when you've gone from fifth, sixth, and what was it that was the, the factor that decided to get the fourth time you had what was required? Uh, so uh, the question was, uh, you know, there's a lot of persistence involved and uh, if I didn't make it on try number four, would have, uh, what if I kept going for try number five and six and what was the difference when I got selected? Um, I, I think most astronauts uh, have to interview more than one time. Um, it, it, uh, so it's not unusual um, to have to, to, to apply and, and be interviewed multiple times and so on. Uh, for me, I, I was going to keep trying until it was, uh, you know, I'd still be trying now. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I ever would have stopped. I would have just kept, I would have just kept sending an application in whenever they had an announcement. So, um, and as far as what made the difference, um, the only thing I can figure is that it was the largest class ever and there was a few mistakes. <laughs> That and there's a there's an astronaut with a similar last name to mine, Ms. Rick Mastracchio, and and Mastracchio Massimino in the Northeast, you know, they they see a lot of Italian names, they can tell the difference, but in Texas, you know, they <laughs> so they were like, there can't be two of them, can you? And they're like, I don't know, take them both, and that's what they did. So that I think made the difference. I really, I, I, you know, I don't know. I I think you know, in general, they try to look for people who are team players. It's not always. You know, the smartest person, it's not always the, you know, the most esteemed scientist, but it's uh, generally it's people that can work together as a team, people you can get along with and work together with. And I think that that's something that is important, for, I think, for everybody, but particularly in, in the astronaut business. But, you know, what made a difference one time to the next, it's just a lot of it, I think, is good fortune as well. You know, there's a little bit of luck, in, or in my case, I think a lot of luck actually involved when you get picked. Right here. Yeah. When you disengage all that hardware on an EVA, what keeps those little bits and pieces from floating into places they're not supposed to? Yeah, so the um, the little the question was when you when you're doing a repair like we did, all the little what keeps all the bits and pieces from floating around. So I'm glad you asked that because maybe I can explain this a little bit better. This uh, this capture plate. The idea was we had all those little screws, right? And they had washers, and they had staking debris that could come off the threads and nothing is allowed to get inside the telescope. You can't have any anything. No debris at all is allowed inside of there. We had to be really careful not to rub or bump or do anything we weren't supposed to in there to create any debris inside the telescope once we opened those doors. And um, so now we're going to take all these screws out and we don't want to lose any of them. So the, the team came up with the idea if we could get this plate on there somehow. So this plate has a bunch of holes on it. Can you, I'll hold it over my shoulder like this, okay? And you can see all these holes that it has in it. Each one of these holes lines up with a fastener, with a screw that was on the, the electronics board cover. So we took, very carefully removed four bigger screws on the outside, put some guide studs in there. What, what do we have here? Do we have, this is the disposal bag. Sorry, it doesn't matter. So this is where I put the old hand drill. I didn't, I didn't, is this the flight unit? This the flight one? This is my garbage bag from space, <laughs> where we put the, the hand drill went inside of here. This thing expands. We'll take it. No, no you're not. <laughs> Goddard paid for this one. So uh, the American people paid for this one. Right? You're not even smiling. You're not going to let this thing go, are you? You need to stay awake here. You need to stay awake. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, so the handrail, uh, the handrail went in here. But we had... Um, we had some. Uh, we took out four screws on on these on on each the, the extremes of where this panel was, and put some big studs inside of it, and then installed this on top. Okay. So once this was in front of me and secured, um, each one of these holes lined up with one of the fasteners that I was able to remove with the power tool. And so the hole here is big enough so that the tool head could go through it. Right. The bit could go through it, but that the screw would not come out. So the screws and the washers and anything else that was kicked up was floating inside of there. So what I was looking at was through all these windows were little screws floating around. So they were kept inside by this capture plate. And when the last one came off, then the whole plate could be removed. Are so they that's magnetized, so they stay on the back side of it? Or they no, they were not magnetized. So they just floated inside of there, and they, the holes were, like I said, small enough 
Well, large enough so that you could get the tool through it, but small enough so that nothing could come out. But so everything was captured. Plate off, what happens to them? So then, okay, they were floating. So when, when you took the plate off, the plate is now attached to this. Okay, so the, what we did. There's this. Follow, yeah, so what happened is now this, the plate was here, so we attached this to the side of the plate with these guide studs that we had, right? These four places. So now they're together. And as we remove all of these screws, the panel, which is on my side now, comes off the instrument and goes with this thing. And in between the panel on the instrument and this capture plate, we're floating inside of each one of these windows, the screws cool. and the washers and anything else that was kicked up. Can I just say, I'm a Pluto mom. Quick You're a Pluto mom. A Pluto mom. <laughs> <laughs> there was, no, now this was the fourth one, yeah. Where were you when you found out that you were going to be selected to fly? Did anything like, did you get any amusing stories about stuff that went through your mind when you found out you'd been selected? Well, I was selected to be an astronaut or to fly Hubble? To fly. To fly. To fly Hubble. Um, I, I was just really, did I have any like amusing stories about, um, uh, or something funny that happened? Or What went through your mind? What went through my mind was, uh, wow, this is going to be really cool. And then, <laughs> wow, I hope I don't break that telescope. <laughs> That's pretty much it, yeah. But I was real. I was very excited. I was. I was thrilled. Up there, one. Where? No. Where were you? There you are. Yeah. Um, so I understand you had a problem with the RSUs, mm -hmm. gyros, and when you were replacing those, did you uh, have to install a spare or something? What happened with that one that would not fit? How did you resolve? It? Yeah. So we were putting these or the gyro. The gyro. The question. Yeah. Yeah. We were putting the, the questions. Thanks. The question was uh, with the with the RSUs, the rate sensor unit, the gyros that we were replacing, um, uh, we had to use a spare gyro. And what happened was, is there were there were three of these RSUs that needed to be replaced, rate sensor units. And the, as you're looking at the telescope, the one on the right came out, and the new one went in fine. Then we went to the left side, and uh, we couldn't get that one seated to drive it home. And so I think what we did, and Ed Rezac is sitting here could correct me, but I think we took the one that was going to go in the middle and put it on the left. Is that we before we went and fetched the, the spare in the back? Uh, no, we went and got the spare. Do we get? Do we put the spare in, in on the left, or do we use the one that was going to go in the center? Because we couldn't get the one in the center. I think the one that was going to go on the left. <laughs> the one that was going to go on the left side. I can't, I can't remember that one, two, or three. But the one I was, I think. The one you couldn't see. The one we couldn't see. Wouldn't fit anywhere. Wouldn't fit anywhere. So what we did was, is we got, I think we tried to put the one that was going to go in the number two position. Right. There. You brought that up. And that worked okay. We were able to get that in. And then the one that wouldn't seat on the left, we tried to put in the center. It wouldn't seat there either. Exactly. So then we went to the back and got our spare RSU. Yeah. And put that one in. And was that spare? Was that was that the same design as the two that you put in, or was that the same? Si it was uh, it was the same size. I think it didn't have well, it didn't have some it was something different about it. It didn't have as good as something. The the I think the baby bumpers. Um, well, that's the reason it didn't go in. But the spare was not it was not quite as good. It didn't go in is when we refurbished it. Yeah. There was some extra staking material. Mass, I'm the RSU lady. Oh, there we go. Where, where are you? Marion, right? Marion, how are you, Marion? What was the story with that one? <laughs> yeah. Great, great to see you. I didn't know you were there. I didn't have the enhanced flex leads, the ones that. That's were what I was thinking of, yeah. The right, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Marion. Uh, the one that would not fit, it had uh, someone was a little too liberal with the staking material underneath the blanket material, and it just would not fit. But the spare did fit. Thank and, you, Marion. Uh, it, it's up there working just it's fine right now. We're really talking Still history here, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Marion. Thank okay. you very much. It's great to see you. Right here. See you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ask a question. Well, we'll start up there and then down here. Go ahead. Oh, what was it like to be on the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> ah. <laughs> The Big Bang Theory, uh, the TV show. Everyone watch that TV show? Anybody watch that thing? Uh, that was really fun. Um, I, I enjoyed. I was on it. I've been on it six times, and uh, each time I've really enjoyed it. I was on. The last time I was on was in this fall, in September. 
um, but it, it's really fun. They're, they're really a, it's a it's a it's a great group of people to work with. Just like the Hubble team, the Big Bang Theory team is really. Fun. I don't know what other TV shows are like, but I can't imagine they're as much fun as being on the Big Bang Theory. The actors and and uh, actresses and the writers are really funny people, and uh, the producers, directors, all that. It's just it's just really a fun experience. One of the most fun things I've ever done. So I, I, I really love. It. I hope I get a chance to go back. I really love doing that show. Yeah, I hope so too. Right here. Do you attribute your bubbly personality to your Italian heritage? <laughs> <laughs> and who would be asking such a question? Hmm. Uh, no. In fact, I'm the worst. I think a lot of Italian people seem depressed. Have you noticed this? I've been noticing this. A lot of them like they're down and depressed. I don't know what. No, I have no idea. Uh, I guess maybe I'm just happy to be here. I'll take it as a compliment. Thank you. Right here. So I find all the crew aid tools fascinating, but do you have a favorite for one reason or another? Do you have a favorite tool? A favorite crew aid tool, yeah, so. <laughs> a a what? favorite uh, crew, what do you see talking about out of this here? Or in general. Just in general. Um, I, I, there, no, I don't want to play any favorites. They're all great. <laughs> that, that, that power tool is pretty cool, though. Because that was, you know, that was. Can uh, I lift it? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> The, the power tool was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was really, I think maybe because we spent that and this, we spent a lot of time on this one too, didn't we? Coming up with, there was a lot of little details about this, what kind of, what kind of material we were going to use so we wouldn't get glare so we could see it, see clearly through what was going on. But the power tool, um, was a, was really a new and a new thing to come up with and exciting because, uh, um, it, it, it involved a lot of design and a lot of uh, crew interaction with it. And uh, Justin, who's sitting right here, used to go. Remember, he said, "Help me." We said, "You'd be right next to me." It was hard to tell whether or not the thing was level in the water if I was holding it straight, right on for some of the tests. And and while well, we were practicing in the pool, like you saw in the water, you know, Justin was right there next to me a lot of the time, telling me move it up a little, down a little bit, and so on. So it was really, I think, a fun project for everyone involved. That's probably my favorite one, I guess. Right down here. Oh yes, get back at him. That's right. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> no more questions. <laughs> How much sleep did you get? <laughs> How much sleep did I get? That's great. About as much as you did tonight. Uh, a lot of sleep. No. We. Um, sorry, Doc. I. Um, the, uh, we we get you try to get about eight hours. My first flight we didn't we didn't quite match. We didn't get anywhere close to that. We were we didn't get very much sleep. It seemed like um, uh, the second flight. I, I you know I think for a variety of reasons we were uh, we were able to pretty much get close to believe it or not close to eight hours a night. Um, maybe not quite that much, but you know maybe seven or so. But. Um, but you know you want to be you want to get your you want to get your rest if you can. But that that's kind of unusual. My first flight was more like we were getting like five hours of sleep, and we were we were a bit tired by the end. The second flight we we were able to get to bed more on time, more like we were on time than we were the first flight. I think I think the biggest difference between the first and the second sleep wise was that after for us we had we had was our spacewalks we had five of them in a row, five days in a row consecutively spacewalking. So after the spacewalks were done. You had to you know, get the guys out of the suit or come out of your suit, and then you know you have a little bit of time to relax, maybe. But then you got to get ready for the next day, so you got a lot of stuff to do. You got to get all the tools together. You got to get the seats, the, the suits changed out. And I think one thing, believe it or not, that made a difference was that on our first flight, we were on Space Shuttle Columbia, and it was an internal airlock, meaning that the airlock was kind of in the cabin with you, and it cut down the amount of space you had, and we weren't able to stage all the suits the way we would have liked to because we were confined with room. The second flight on Atlantis though, was an external airlock. If you go see Atlantis down in the Kennedy Space Center, one of my friends I was having dinner with here showed me a picture of it. You can see the external airlock. It's in the payload bay. And that gave us a, a big, a larger amount of room where we could stage the suits a lot easier and stuff didn't have to come in and out and it saved us a lot of time. So that was, that was one thing. Um, that that I think helped us, and and we, we were able to get more more rest on the second flight. But you, you try you're scheduled for eight hours, but you never really get 
get quite that. I mean, yes, yeah, the sleep period, and then then you got to go to sleep too. You know, you're kind of excited. So especially the first couple of nights is a little bit harder to sleep. And uh, but I remember probably you know after the first first seven seven days or so, I was I was falling asleep and sleeping all the way until it was time to you know to the wake up music went. So I got more, I guess more used to it and maybe a little bit uh, calmer and able to sleep. Uh, uh, so yeah. <laughs> okay, there were three, and let's hope they're quick questions down here, or quick answers, one or the other. Three here, and then one over here. Go ahead. Your EVA, there's the plant right there. Is it loud inside the suit, or is it quiet? No, it's, it's pretty quiet. You have the it's only thing... Loud, yeah, what's it like inside the suit? What do you hear? What's it loud inside of the spacesuit? So in the... Uh, in the spacesuit, you really don't hear very much. You have a communications cap on, so you can hear people talk to you, and you can hear the, the, the discussion between the ground and the people inside of the space shuttle. So, and you're talking mainly directly to the people inside the space shuttle. They try not to have you talk directly to the ground. Things start getting out of control. The person inside the spacecraft, we call them the, the, the IVA, the intravehicular astronaut who's in charge of kind of choreographing, reading the checklist and running the whole show there in space. You, everything's supposed to go through that person, more or less. And then he, he or she will ask the ground and then whatever's relayed up will come back out to the crew. Um, so you hear that, that discussion going on. And other than that, you hear a fan noise in the background because you have this pump fan assembly inside of the suit that is a pretty, pretty much an engineering miracle. It's a very small device, but it's able to uh, pump water, air, and separate water from air. Um, and it, you hear that in the background. Mm, you can hear that, and that's a good thing to hear because you know your suit's working. Yeah. If you don't hear that, yeah, right. you know that, so you hear that noise inside the suit. But you could be banging all you want, you won't hear anything. You can hear it. You can hear it inside the spaceship. Whenever, whenever the spacewalkers would come into the airlock and start banging stuff around, like, "Hey, keep it quiet down there!" They're like banging around, but they couldn't hear anything because they had no medium to hear that. But you can, you know, that'll vibrate through the through the space shuttle. But it's pretty pretty peaceful. Right. Then there was yeah, right. I'm a little here at the museum, the education department, and one thing I get asked the most is, "How can I become an astronaut?" Like, like young kids ask me that. And what would you like one thing that you like to tell younger visitors about space? I'm going to repeat the question. How can I become an astronaut? And what do we tell younger, younger kids. There's kids about? So I think the best way to become an astronaut is uh, to, to, to do what you like doing. And um, there's no set plan. You know, there's, uh, I know Michael Leigh is, is here. There may be some other astronauts here. I don't know if Tom Jones is here. I saw Tom earlier. I don't know if he's around, but. He said he might be, he probably ran for the hills already. But, um, but uh, each of us had a different path. And um, uh, I think the, the way to do it is to, is to do something you like. And, and the, if you look at the crews, the people I flew with, just in my, my little space shuttle crews, uh, we had engineers, aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers. We had astronomers, uh, physicists, but we also had a geologist, mm -hmm. okay? Drew Foisel's a PhD in geology. Uh, Megan MacArthur was a PhD in oceanography, mm -hmm. right? And Rick Linehan was a veterinarian, okay? So, what does that have to do with going to space, right? You know, maybe astronomer or aerospace engineer makes sense, maybe. What about these other things? Well, what it is is that it's a technical discipline. And whether it's medicine or math or science or engineering or whatever it might be, just about every one of those disciplines is important and gives you the right type of preparation to be qualified to be an astronaut. So you should pick what you want to do. And, and I, but it's probably, if you really want to be an astronaut, you should stick to something that's technical, you know, more of the STEM fields, because uh, that's what, that's what, that's the common thing, is that it's some STEM field, um, science, technology, engineering, math field. Um, and as far as what to tell little kids, I guess I would tell them, tell them that, you know, find, try to find out what it is that you really love, and then if you can identify that, pursue it, whether it's the space program or and it's something else, you know, you, you know, follow follow what it is you're passionate about, and and do your best at it, and good things will happen. Yeah. And there was one more over here. Yeah. Um, can you describe? Was there any big difference between training in the pool versus the reality of working out? The difference between training in the pool and the reality of space. 
Um, you are trained in the pool really well to be able to do your job. And I remember uh, my first spacewalk and my first mission, we changed out a reaction wheel. And um, I remember closing the door, it was the end of the spacewalk, closing the, the door to that, to that equipment bay. And uh, the thought went through my mind, you know, that was the first time you ever saw that thing for real, but I felt like I'd done it many times before because I'd done it in the pool. I had never seen the telescope before it launched. It was my first time working on it for real. But they train you so well. These, this team here trains us so well to do our job. I felt I'd done it a hundred times. Um, so that is, that is really good training that we get. You're very well prepared to do your job. What you're not prepared for is the environment around you. And this, uh, the view, the, the experience of being out there, seeing the planet and being out there in space is just unbelievable. There is nothing that can prepare you to do that. So in some ways your training prepares you perfectly, but in other ways there's no way it could really prepare you for what you're really going to experience emotionally or yeah. what you're going to see around you. And I think there was one other question here. I, I forgot. Who was it? Because <laughs> we really only have time for one more. Go ahead. What do we think about that? Thanks to you, hundreds of astrophysicists have a job and are played all over the world and can share their passion and, uh, and discovery with the public. What do you think about that? I didn't catch that. Thanks to you and your team, right. hundreds of scientists, astrophysicists all over the world have a job and are paid and can share their discovery and uh, passion with the public. Okay, so thanks, thanks to us, thanks to my crew, and I guess I would share it with the whole Hubble team here, right? Thanks to us, folks. The, the astronomers have a job and make discoveries and get paid. Yes. <laughs> I think we need to get a percentage of this. That's what I think. I, think I, never, we, I never thought of it like that. I think we've gone far enough. I think we need to. I think we need to. Thought we need to get some agents involved here. And um, yeah. I think. Uh, I, I think what you're saying is it's not. What it is it's really? Everyone has their role on a team, and I think that. Um, um, I personally, and I think probably the other the guys here uh, who worked on Hubble, um, I, I, f I feel very gratified that they are able to make those discoveries. You know, I'm not a, people would start asking me, sci you know, like astronomy, my neighbors would say, oh, you know what's going on tonight in the sky? I'm like, I don't know what. And they're like, oh, you know, Mars is over here and there's a planet there and some stars coming around this side. And it's the first time it's happening. Don't, what do you think about that? I go, I don't know. And they go, well, didn't you work on Hubble? I go, yeah, I worked on Hubble. I don't look through the telescope. I just fix it. <laughs> So, you know, my, I don't know what they find, I mean, I don't know how they come up with this stuff, but, uh, but they do, you know, and, and uh, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's funny, when we meet the scientists at the Space Telescope Science Institute, um, we, go, we go by there for a number of reasons, because to get an appreciation for what they're doing, the astronomers, and I think mainly so we understand that if we screw it up, they won't have jobs too. You know, hey, we've got families, don't mess up our telescope. Um, but I, no, I think it's more than that. I think it's kind of like a mutual respect sort of thing. They're very appreciative of us going at the team here and the astronauts who go up and, and work on the telescope so they can do, they're very appreciative of that. But I, I think I'm just as appreciative and I think I'm speaking for the rest of the people here who work on Hubble, very appreciative of these astronomers who are able to use the telescope to make these great discoveries. And so I, I am very, you know, we've had one Nobel Prize so far. I think there's more coming, I hope. And I think anyway, I would be as expect there's more. There's so it's there's very, two, what, two, there's two, two more coming? Yeah. There's well, two I more? shouldn't say, yes. <laughs> oh, you mean the one Nobel Prize with the three recipients? Yeah. No, That's I mean, there's one Nobel Prize so far, right? The, for the accelerating. Yeah, yeah, for the dark energy thing. That's right. Okay, so we got, we got that one, and maybe more coming. You, you know about know. more coming? Maybe. Oh, I thought you were making an announcement. Um, <laughs> so um, I'd have to update my, my talk. But, uh, but I, I, I really is kind of, I think, like a mutual kind of fun respect camaraderie thing where, you know, they, 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 we really enjoy working on the telescope and designing the spacewalks and these tools and this magnificent machine. And then, then they, were, they were able to use it to make these great discoveries. So, you know, if, if we, if I look at it really, if we didn't have all these smart, dedicated astronomers, well, we'd be out of luck, you know, who would, who would look through the telescope if we didn't, if we didn't have all these, these dedicated, smart astronomers. So, uh, you know, we appreciate what, what they're able to do with it. 
Well, I want to thank you for a most amazing evening. The evening is not over for everyone because I understand you are willing to sit at the uh, docent uh, information desk and uh, talk to what? people directly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. However, we do have to vacate before dawn. <laughs> thank you very, very much. I just want to say that uh, we are halfway through the series uh, this year, and the next uh, two in, that will be in June uh, will be uh, devoted to some of the most uh, amazing scientific uh, discoveries by the Hubble, uh, by those who devoted um, more energy than we can imagine to delving into the beginning of time with the Hubble Space Telescope. We'll be hearing from Bob Williams and Sandy Faber in early June. June, and then a wrap-up from Robert Smith in late June, who has told the world in ways that I think are extremely impressive in his book on the Space Telescope, that the Hubble Space Telescope changed what it meant to be an astronomer. Good night.